Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto thee that thy mercies are new every morning. And we pray for thy forgiveness that so often, our Father, we concentrate on the powers of evil and forget thy power. Are mindful of what the powers of darkness are doing, but are not mindful of thy word and of thy word. Make us mindful, our Father, that all things are in thy hands, and that the government is upon thy shoulders, so that we may truly worship thee and magnify thy holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Our subject today is the Council of Chalcedon, Foundation of Western Liberty, and our scripture, Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. The Council of Chalcedon, C-H-A-L-C-E-D-O-N, Foundation of Western Liberty. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see one good cometh but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a soft land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river. He shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the earth drawn. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. We have seen thus far in our studies of the council that the battle was between Christianity and humanism, between the worship of God and the worship of man. We have seen how humanism, after Christianity began to gain power, altered its attack and took an entirely different approach. It said, in effect, let us affirm Christianity. Let us affirm every orthodox doctrine of the faith and then take it and put it to another use. Affirm it and then twist it subtly. So that philosophically, while we are affirming the orthodox doctrines of the faith, we are destroying them. The goal of humanism, of course, was the exaltation of and the worship of man. And for humanism, salvation is not an act of God's grace, but man's self-deification, man's work. And for humanism, the state is the expression of all the divine powers that are inherent in the universe. The state is the divine human order by which men must be saved. The issue at Chalcedon, which was called in 451, was a critical one. The orthodox doctrine that Jesus Christ is very God, a very God, and very man, a very man, had been firmly established. It was recognized now that this is the hallmark of orthodoxy, that anyone who denies this faith is not of Christ. And so the statists were taking this doctrine and saying, of course we believe it. But when this incarnation took place, the divine became human and the human became divine. So that they said there was a confusion of the two natures. Each became the other. Now, this seems like a purely technical point. And to the average man sitting in a church, this perhaps seemed like quibbling and hair-splitting. 
But the humanist knew the philosophical implications of this. If you permitted a confusion of the two natures, you are opening the door wide open to the deification of the emperor as God incarnate and the state as the divine order. So that again you would have a worship of the state and of its ruler. Now when the Council of Chalcedon was called, it seemed a poor time to have a debate about a fine theological point. The Western Empire was in flames. The barbarians were ranging from one end to the other at will. The very city where about 21 years ago, prior to the Council, St. Augustine had died, had already been raised by the barbarians. The Eastern Empire, Byzantium, was showing signs of crumbling, and not many would have said that it had long lived. On the Eastern frontier, the tremendous Persian Empire, militantly anti-Christian, dedicated to Mazdaism, a faith which is essentially dualistic and is the foundation to all modern Illuminism and many medieval heresies, such as the Albigensian heresy, was beginning to move westward and was throwing all its power against the little state Armenia, which was in its path. It seemed as though the world was going to crumble very quickly. A poor time, in other words, for a council to meet, some would have said, on hair-splitting doctrine, but the council met, 451 A.D. The issue is critical. And the victory that was won at Chalcedon is a great one. The name Chalcedon does not appear in your school textbooks. Graduate students at universities may encounter the name in some of their books, and they may not. And yet there would be no liberty in the Western world if it were not for Chalcedon. Chalcedon and its victory is the foundation of Western liberty. And today those who are attempting to fight the subversives are doomed unless they build on this foundation and in full knowledge of its implications. The humanistic goal was to subvert Christianity, to work by using Christian dogma either to keep God at a distance and to say indeed there is a God out there, but he is silent, remote, and so man is free to do as he pleases, or else to make man God and set him free from God's law. At the Council of Nicaea, the great figure was Athanasius. At the Council of Ephesus, the great figure was very clearly St. Cyril. St. Cyril, although dead some years, dominated Chalcedon to a great extent because it was the work of Cyril that was carried on. But it was carried on through a man who was not present at the council, who was not able to attend, St. Leo, Bishop of Rome. In his tome or letter which he sent to the council, St. Leo stated the fundamentals of the Augustinian, Cyrillian, and Athanasian doctrines, the biblical doctrine, very plainly. And the council was tremendously swayed by his letter. 
after its deliberations, the council formulated the definition of Chalcedon concerning the two natures of Christ and their relationship. The definition reads, Therefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his manhood, like us in all respects apart from sin, as regards his Godhead begotten of the Father before the ages, but yet as regards his manhood begotten for us men and for our salvation of Mary the Virgin, the Theotokos, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and subsistence, not as part or separated into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten God, the Word, Lord Jesus Christ, even as the prophets from earliest times spoke of him. And our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and the creed of the fathers has handed down to us. This is a difficult and very complex statement, and yet the issues are very simple. God or man, Christ or the state. What did this definition do? It set Christianity forever apart from Greek and pagan, from all humanistic notions of being and of nature. It declared emphatically that there was no union possible between man and God on man's terms, and on God's terms it was without confusion. In other words, what it said was that nature cannot ascend or evolve into the supernatural. Now this was the essence of all humanism in antiquity, and of course today as well. It said that all nature was evolving upward and was ultimately going to become God. And the form it took when it became God was the state, so that the state as it moved upward became progressively more and more divine, so that if you were looking for God, the place to find him was in the state and in the head of the state. Now this is the essence of humanism. It is the worship of man, and particularly of man in the collective form. In the modern form, for example, Hegel said, the state is God walking on the earth. This was the only God he recognized. The followers of Hegel are the Marxists, the Existentialists, the Fabians, the Pragmatists. They are Hegelians all. And they are busy creating that God walking on the earth. But what Chalcedon said in its formula was that the gap between God and man could only be bridged by God and then without confusion. So that the two natures of Christ although in perfect union, were without change and without confusion. In other words, salvation is not by nature, not by the state, but by God. The bridge between God and man is bridged only by God through Jesus Christ. Second, the Council of Chalcedon, by this definition, raised a standard against mysticism. Mysticism did creep in. 
but it has always been by the neglect of Chalcedon. What does mysticism claim? The mystic claims that either by meditation or experience or by certain works, he can ascend to the point where he becomes absorbed into the Godhead so that he loses himself and becomes God. In Oriental, in particular in Hindu mysticism, the combination of the mystical experience is to say to yourself, Thou art that. In other words, you are now God. This is personal mysticism, individual mysticism. It is the belief that man, a creature, can become God through some form of experience or another. But there is also collective mysticism. In individual mysticism, it is the individual who becomes God. In collective mysticism, it is the state which says, we will become God by our works, by our evolution, by our experience. We will raise ourselves up and become God incarnate on earth. The whole point of the iconoclastic controversy in Byzantium was simply this. The emperors said that they were the true representation of God on earth. And the true icons to be worshipped were their icons, their images. In the Holy Roman Empire, this was a repeated problem. And Otto III, for example, declared himself to be the successor of the apostles and the true vicar of the church. Again, with Emperor Maximilian in 1512, he planned to make himself Pope and to rule the entire civilized world of the day as God on earth, in effect. Dostoevsky, looking at the modern world, commented on where the danger is. And he declared, not the church becoming state, but the state becoming church. Mark that well. Chalcedon, by its definition of the exclusiveness of the incarnation and declaring that in this single act of the union of the divine and the human, it was without confusion and without change declared orthodoxy forever to be hostile to mysticism. Third, salvation was made totally Christian. It is the work of Christ, the work of God, not of man or the state. Man has been in trouble since the beginning of the world. Man has needed saving. And if man does not have God as his savior, he will have the state. And for orthodoxy, Jesus Christ and Christ alone is the savior. And the council moved in terms of this, for the faith declares there is none other name under heaven by which men may be saved save Jesus Christ. And our Lord declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the door. The liturgies of the day celebrated their joy in this salvation. For example, the liturgies of St. John Chrysostom and Basil the Great declared, Adam is recalled. The curse is made void. Eve is set free. Death is slain. And we are made alive. Wherefore in hymns we cry aloud, Blessed art thou, O Christ our God. In the same liturgy, on the proportion of the Nativity of Christ, we read, 
The virgin today cometh into a cave to bring forth ineffably the word that is before the ages. Dance thou universe on hearing the tidings. Glorify with the angels and the shepherds him that willed to be hoped to be beheld a little child, the God before the ages. Can you sense their victory here? They were meeting with the barbarians roaming across the western half of the empire. And the eastern half at the time showing signs of crumbling and the Persian empire moving to the east. And yet they could chant and sing, dance that universe this was their sense of victory Chalcedon moreover made it emphatic that history is the work and plan of God not of man the word was God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made Chalcedon met to ram home the victory of Ephesus to throw a roadblock in the path of the humanists and the statists its victory was a tremendous one the issue was simply this how is man saved by man's upward reach or by God's downward reach by man's works or God's grace, by God or the state. And Chalcedon made it in fact, God alone is man's savior in and through Jesus Christ. Man needs saving. And apart from the tradition of Chalcedon, in every corner of the world, man looks to the state to be the savior. He looks to the state to give him cradle to grave security. And the state offers him an umbrella, as it were, under which all things should find shelter and salvation. And the state says, I will be your savior from all the problems of sickness and poverty, from hunger, from all problems. Come unto me, I am your savior. Western liberty began when the state ceased to be man's savior and became simply, as scripture required, the ministry of justice. Liberty perishes where Christ ceases to be man's savior. Man needs a savior. And if he will not believe in Jesus Christ, he's going to go to the state for salvation because this he has to have. Take tomorrow every subversive, communist, vegan, socialist, any and every group and exterminate them. And what will the end result be? No different. Within a year you will find the world in the same situation it is today. Because where men will not have Christ to be their Savior, the state will be their God and Savior. Man requires a Savior, Christ or the state. No man can choose the one without denying the other. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks that through thy word thou hast declared unto us the good news of salvation in and through Jesus Christ. We thank thee that thou hast reared up unto thee godly men, saints of old, to defend and to declare this faith. And we thank thee, our Father, that thou hast delivered unto us this same faith and summoned us to do battle in thy name. 
Make us therefore more than conquerors through him that loved us. And make us bold in confidence that we might not fear the power of darkness nor the works of Satan, but might know how great thou art might move in the confidence if God be for us who can be against us bless us to this purpose in Jesus name Amen are there any questions now yes the divine right of king uh, coming to the standard uh, the state or the uh, ruler Yes, the divine right of kings came directly out of Greek humanism. When Aristotelianism was revived and introduced into Christian Europe, the same concept was reintroduced. And the monarchs of Europe very quickly picked it up. And as a result, you had the divine right of kings. And it is simply this old pagan statism. The state is man's savior. In England, for example, one of the things that was a uh, regular ritual was to bring the sick and the blind and others to the king of England for the king's touch. Because since he had represented the power of God on earth, almost an incarnation of God, then he had the power to heal so that these people would be lined up for the king's touch. And this continued in England uh, well past the time when the United States was first settled. You can understand, therefore, what it was that the Puritans who fled from England were escaping. It was this kind of total statism and substitute for Christianity. Yes? Uh, now, I noticed that uh, LBJ wants to reach out some kind of touch to people. And uh, I guess that he's kind of infected. Was that idea that wouldn't do? As to that I don't know, but certainly in his speeches he does plan to save the world. And he is going to deliver, he says, the world from all problems, sickness, hunger, poverty, ignorance, and so on. So his speeches outline uh, a plan for total salvation. And this is the meaning of the great society. It is the saving society. It's going to be God incarnate, as it were. Yes. Uh, well, the, uh, the humanists are looking for salvation by the state, but it's much different than we are. I mean, it, it all has to do with this world, is it not? Yes. And they're, if they control our lives, isn't that, it's just not the here and now. That's all it is. Isn't it? That exactly. Salvation is really just like the period. Right. And, of course, prolonging it indefinitely so that they can have uh, eternal life here and now. Yes. I mean, it's, it's limited. It's Very limited. I've been amused uh, lately to read some of the scientific comments of some scientists on this freezing plan, on the total ridiculousness and absurdity of it. And yet, the two or three scientists who pointed out the absurdity are overwhelmed by the great majority who say, of course, it isn't possible. But what's wrong with experimenting? In other words, they're going to move ahead in the faith that because man is God, he's going to do the impossible. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, this is sort of a power of thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me ask her, actually. Now, the power of thinking certainly must not have worked in a culture where there are a great many hardships, let's say, in Europe, and through famine and plague and all that. No, the power of positive thinking in its modern form, of course, you might say did start here, but it's very ancient. If man is God, 
then his thought is created. Uh, we are told that God spake and his word was created. He created the heavens and the earth by his word. Now, if man is God, just by saying so, he can make things come true. There's a periodical, Humanity is the name of it. In fact, it is the periodical issued by saying so, he can make things come true. There's a periodical, Humanity is the name of it. In fact, it is the periodical issued by the... Uh, some kind of national council of uh, seminaries and by college and university chaplains and this includes not only the Protestant and I believe the Jewish but also the Newman House chaplains and the leading article in the current issue is a very interesting one the article of course is very much to the left in its view on Vietnam on communism on all things else and we are to think in terms of peace, absolute peace, absolute brotherhood. Why? Because our thinking is going to create the world. Because man is the only God there is. And if all men make up their mind or enough of them, that this is going to be, it will be. And the power of positive thinking, you see, rests on the concept that since man is God for these humanists, Man's thought will be created. Yes? Now, where do you put the libertarians? Those that are not Christian and many of them The libertarians are humanists to the core. But they're not looking to the state for salvation. Because they don't want any government. That's true. But they are looking to man. In other words, each man is capable. He doesn't need the state. But the answer of Marx to this, Marx uh, said it's either this kind of total anarchism or total statism. And he said total statism makes more sense. So Marx was ready to agree with these libertarians. Only, he said, it's not as workable. It's, it leads to all kinds of problems. So why not total statism? Instead of a lot of little gods running around, have one big collective god and you're better off. ecumenical councils were usually called by the emperor the eastern emperor now this was a technicality what usually happened was that the, some prominent father of the day a theologian would get the emperor's ear and ask him to call a council now the emperors were not always happy with the results in fact they were almost always very unhappy and that's why the councils didn't meet more often but the pressure of the theologians in the church led to the calling of the council the councils usually tried to meet fairly briefly a matter of a few months at the most very careful minutes were taken of the meetings and you can find these in Means Patrology, M-I-G-N-E. They're uh, quite full, and you also have, of course, the decisions on every point recorded. So, so all that material and would be available to uh, people studying the Right. And, and yet, it's unknown totally unknown even among churchmen yes uh, a churchman uh, uh, and I heard it mentioned uh, said instead of the Holy Trinity today we have the unholy Trinity of Mark and Freud and Charmaine and Tyler Charmaine <laughs> now <laughs> that was yes. how does the Charmaine differ then from the Hegelian uh, humanistic philosophy 
Chardin is definitely in the Hegelian tradition. Very, very definitely. It's just a variation, and you might as well get it straight from Hegel. Chardin's influence is frightening. When you realize that 10, 15 years ago, he was barely in the church, and any day might have been kicked out, and only by keeping his writing silent did he survive. Today, he is one of the most influential of all figures. But his works are very definitely far out. He denies the infallibility of scripture in favor of the infallibility of this evolutionary process. And he does use the term infallibility once with reference to it. So it's a shocking system. He belongs in the unholy trinity. Yes? Chalcedon was a fairly small community uh, within the boundaries of Byzantium in what we now call Asia Minor, so that uh, it was not too distant from Constantinople. Is it known by that name yet? No, no. At this time, the great theologians were all in the East, and uh, this is the one council that is dominated by someone from the West, St. Leo. Uh, well, we shall come next time to the Athanasian Creed, which, however, was a product of the West. But up until now, the East dominated predominantly. And in, next week, when we come to the Athanasian Creed, it is, of course, a product of Gaul, or what we would call now France. Yes. I was reading my paper about Johnson's uh, new war, kind of how it's developing new war of some sort. Yes. Uh, to me, it was humanistic from the start to finish because uh, he was going to get everybody to college, get their education, anybody that was broke, he was going to see they had money, mm -hmm. and all those things. And, uh, I mean, there's no uh, thought of responsibility. Yeah. Would you care to comment on uh, something like that? Yes, it is a program of salvation. And you see, to him, politics means salvation. They no longer think of the state as the ministry of justice. Justice has nothing to do with it. You're going to save man. But here is a program of salvation that doesn't change man. Christ changes men. He makes them new creatures. He gives them a new heart. But the state takes men and their sins and says you are now saved because we're going to save you so that it gives them all kinds of privileges which only confirm them in their sin and depravity. So the salvation of the state only leads to greater crisis and catastrophe. Yes? In, in yesterday's case, there was one article entitled Pastors, the Lord God, and the Church. And uh, it goes on and on, but he says that And that has nothing to do with uh, Nigeria or anything like that. No, there is no connection. They don't pretend to be biblical. They'll just read something in order to say they uh, have read the Bible. Well, he spoke of the early church and the church within the church. No. As a matter of fact, the early church was segregated. First of all, in New Testament times, it was segregated between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. And there was a good reason for that. The Jewish believers were so far superior that the, uh, to integrate the two would have meant more confusion. And when you realize that, say, in uh, the Corinthian church, they didn't even know that fornication or adultery was a sin. Because in the Greek world, there was nothing wrong with that. 
After all, the chambers of commerce in Greece, in Corinth, and elsewhere, in Corinth, the chambers of commerce maintained regularly around 2,000 prostitutes for all visiting businessmen. It was a manufacturing town and so on. And no one thought there was anything immoral about that or about men having relations with prostitutes. Uh, this was all taken for granted. So, in the Gentile churches, the moral standard was pretty low. It was a lot of hard work for a couple of generations and more to bring them up to any kind of standard. Well, the Jewish congregations represented a far higher moral standard, and so they were segregated, and Paul saw nothing wrong with that, nor did any other apostle. So the principle of segregation was present there from the beginning. There are a couple of things I'd like to share with you from recent uh, newspaper uh, issues. One is a uh, United Press International wire release. Uh, Dr. Louis Leakey, the anthropologist, whose recent discovery of Kenya Pithecus Africanus is considered to be one of the most uh, marvelous scientific finds, has been again talking uh, quite loudly and vocally. He found uh, a few pieces of uh, skeletal remains, and of course he knows all about when man originated and what man was like then and a great deal else. Now, if you and I attempted to speak as loudly on such fragmentary data, we would be considered insane, but the scientists can do it. And he's telling us that we survived some 20 million years ago because we weren't tasty enough. In short, there were more delicious morsels around, and that's why the saber-toothed tigers and others didn't wipe out the primitive men. Now, this is called science nowadays, and you find something every week in the papers about Dr. Leakey, who, having discovered a few bones, is talking all over the world now and cashing in very, very heavily indeed on those few dry bones. <laughs> yes. Yes. That was on television. The only time you put on television was the bomb scare. Mm -hmm. Well, this is called science. Anyone who believes they have discovered anything or that they know anything about the origins of man is a bigger fool than they are. Because the man who's made a fool of by fools is the bigger fool. <laughs> then there was an interesting article recently in The Wanderer on the myth of overpopulation, which I hope you noticed. Uh, I'd like to read a few passages from it. The writer Murray Norris of Ventura County says, If we gathered up all the three and three-tenths billion people of the world and stood them shoulder to shoulder, we could easily get them all into Ventura County here in California. In fact, if we gave each of them six square feet to stand in, we could fit every last one of them into one, into the national forest portion of Ventura County, and probably still have room for some of them to lie down. This, this would leave us just as we are today in the rest of the county. So what is all this noise about? Then he goes on to say, there are a large number of economists, agronomists, and others who tell us that many parts of the earth are underpopulated and we could easily support 35 billion people, more than 10 times the number of people alive on Earth today. But what about India? At last count, the United Nations in mid-64 figured that India had roughly 374 people per square mile. And if you eliminate the almost unpopulated national park, you would find we have more people per square mile in the rest of Ventura County than there are in India. And if you really want to see a place where they pack people in, why not try the Netherlands, where they have 767 people per square mile. That's more than double the population packing propensities of India. 
But let's take a closer look at the food situation. First off, at least three-fourths of the tillable land on this old earth of ours has not been touched with a plow, and of the rest, only a small portion is intensively farmed. Then he goes on to say, it's true that India has a food crisis, but there are a number of reasons. And he said one of them is that many areas in India have good food supplies, but the lack of transport is hampering the proper distribution. That they're concentrating on trying to build steel mills and the like, and they aren't getting transportation to move food around in the country. Then he goes on to say... uh, that there are some problems of underpopulation. Japan is due for some real problems if it doesn't increase its production of children. Right now, the net production rate in Japan is only 89% for the nation as a whole, and only 80% in Tokyo. This means that Japan is not producing enough children to replace its population. It is short about 13% a year. And then uh, he says this is true uh, in much of the world. In the United States, our population is declining in the countryside and increasing in the cities, so that the deer and the antelope, as well as the bear and beaver, are rapidly returning to areas where they were recently extinct. Uh, Then he goes on to say uh, that recent... U.S. uh, Bureau of the Census figures indicate a very definitely downward trend in the United States. He says, here in Oxnard, California, it appears that the birth rate has dropped nearly 40% in the past five years. And there are indications that it may drop even further this year. In Vienna, Austria, today deaths are exceeding births at the rate of two to one. Two-thirds of the nations of Europe are failing to produce enough children to replace the adult population. Dr. George Carter, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Geographical Society, says that suppression of these facts on population downtrends amounts to scandalous treatment of the data on population, and so on. Now, of course, there is a reason why we are not told the the facts about population or told that this population explosion is from start to finish a myth. The idea is to frighten us into believing that there is not, as some have said, going to be standing room on this earth by the year 2012, in other words, uh, less than 50 years away unless the UN or some other world agency is absolute power over the right of birth, over men, and all things else. There is not the slightest bit of truth to the myth of the population exclusion. Yes? Well, I'm not going to want to worry about this uh, population exclusion. I don't think it has anything to do with evolution, but if you go back increase and decrease. No, I I think uh, that again is uh, to a large extent mythical. Yes. Is there another question, Ms. Sarah? Yes, this was for January the 12th on page 5. Murray Norris. Mm-hmm. Now what was it? Well, he's just 
an act of faith. Yes. Well, that brings up the Russian experiments with grain and things. They, they based it on evolutionary processes, and uh, it was a complete bust. Uh, that, that's one thing that caused the failure of some of their agricultural plants. Right, right. In fact, Dr. Lammerts, who is a noted geneticist and has won 11 international prizes in genetics, has said that one reason why he finds it so easy to outdo the other scientist is because he believes in creationism. So he knows uh, what he's dealing with. But these people are working on the basis of a theory which makes them believe that certain things are possible which are impossible, and as a result, they're badly handicapped. Yes? Don't people confuse evolution with uh, different varieties and Yes, uh, they confuse evolution with uh, changes within a species, and uh, this is not true. You can take a uh, corn and develop it, or a rose and develop it, but you haven't changed it, it's still a rose, and that is not evolution. In fact, it will quickly revert to the original form if it's left to go wild. Yes? Uh, you just raised a thought there. You mentioned pride. Uh, the Russians, if, if they are to, uh, if anybody can benefit there, the only way they can benefit is by receiving some kind of pride. Mm -hmm. uh, recently there was a push in our government to uh, generate I'm glad you brought up this point, too. You see... Uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Yes. But you see, this has been instrumental in the capture of scholarship today. Because the scholar can be sure of any academic institution that if he gives the establishment what they want, he will be rewarded. Some kind of prize or grant will be extended to him. From the state. From the state or from some foundations, and most of the foundations now are virtually agencies of the state or of the establishment. Now, one major Western university uh, had a situation come up a few years ago. A group of wealthy alumni got together, and I met with them in one of their initial meetings, and I have no confidence in them now. They formed a little group and they decided that they were going to stimulate and encourage the faculty members to make a stand for freedom. So they accumulated right off the bat a hundred and I believe it was a hundred and fifty thousand within a week or so afterwards they had all kinds of money. And they went to the Board of Trustees and said, we would like to grant to the faculty members through the university prizes annually for particular kinds of research that are pleasing to us. Say 10,000 to this man and 20,000 to another as an encouragement for those principles which we believe are basic to this country. They were, of course, uh, slapped in the faces by the board and uh, denied recognition, and they have a nominal existence today, but they have folded. But 
The basic principle, of course, is sound. There is no inducement today whatsoever for anyone to do anything to the counter of what's going on in the academic institutions. Well, our time is up now, and we stand dismissed.